are going to be going through John chapter 7, and we will be reading verses 14 through 24. So if you guys are going to turn there and then read along with me. It starts and it says, About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will... He will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered, Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath the man receives circumcision, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we come to this passage, uh, and I just pray that if it's your good pleasure that you can teach us from it, um, that you can uh, teach us out of your word, that we can learn about your character, um, that we can understand what Jesus was trying to teach these people and uh, how we can learn from him. Uh, through this lesson, God. Um, yeah, I pray for all these things uh, in your name, God. Amen. Um, okay, sorry, I'm like all out of sorts. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, I, unfortunately, this is like the one week that I was planning on having like pictures on a PowerPoint. So, but have you guys ever like heard the phrase um, or seen pictures um, that, that goes, it's a relationship, not a religion? Have you guys, any of you guys heard that phrase before or seen, seen pictures? So, um, it's like, it's like a super common phrase, okay? Uh, it's, it's kind of all over the place. Uh, I actually have a book in my office titled Jesus Without Religion, which to be fair is, uh, the title is an unfair picture of what's actually written in the book. I think the goal is to get people to read it. Um, but, but, and then when I Google searched, I found like a ton of like really neat pictures of like wheat fields and, and lakes with, with this phrase on it that says it's a relationship, not a religion. Okay, and I'm not sure uh, what your guys' opinion is of this phrase. Um, it seems like a lot of you guys are hearing it for the first time, so I'm not sure what you, what you think about it. Uh, maybe when you hear this this quote, it's a relationship, not a religion, maybe you groan. You're like, ugh, just stop. Okay, maybe that's your opinion. Maybe you hear this and you cheer. You're like, yes, this is everything I've ever believed about my relationship with Jesus, is that it's a relationship, not a religion. Um, you know, and for me, a while ago, I was on a mission trip, and I just, I kept running into people who kept telling me, they're like, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. Or, like, I love Jesus, but I know that my relationship has nothing to do with religion. I just kept finding people that were saying things like that. You know, and, and for me, even, like, when I was your guys' age, I, I, like, struggled a lot to understand why I had to like practice religion, right? Like this, this was a question that I had. You know, if I was in a relationship with Jesus, if I love Jesus and I know that he loves me, you know, that should be enough, right? Like why, do, why does the other stuff matter? Okay, this is, this is a question that I, I dealt with a lot when I was, when I was your age. You know, this, this relationship, not religion idea, it's, it's all over the place. Okay, 
Um, and uh, it's everywhere because it, it's a very attractive idea, right? Um, this, this idea is an idea that tells us that we can be a Christian, that we can be saved, that we can go to heaven, uh, and that we don't need to worry about the law, right? We can do all this without the law. We just need to believe in Jesus, right? That, that it's about a relationship with Jesus and not a religion about Jesus. This is, this is why this is so attractive to people. And, and certainly, okay, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. It is certainly true that it is only through faith in Jesus that we are saved eternally. Okay, that is true. It is only through faith that we are saved. But guys, there is a serious problem with dismissing the necessity of God's law to our Christian faith. Okay, there is a serious problem with dismissing God's law to our Christian faith. And the first problem with dismissing the importance of the law is that when we dismiss the law, we're actually kind of just throwing the entire Old Testament in the trash. Okay, So if you have to eliminate like three-fourths of the Bible to accept a quote— you should pause, right? You should be like, eh, maybe, maybe this isn't something I should believe in. And if I'm being honest, this it's a relationship, not a religion idea. Eliminates most of the New Testament also. Okay? So this phrase, firstly, kind of dumps the entire Bible in the trash. Okay? So that's one problem. But even worse than that, okay, the second problem with this idea is that when we dismiss God's law... We are dismissing the way that Jesus saves us. Right? Not the way that we receive salvation, which is by grace through faith, but we are dismissing the way that Jesus saves us. You guys, when we try to separate Jesus from the law, when we, when we try and create distance between Jesus and the law, what we're actually doing is we are separating ourselves from Jesus. Okay, because Jesus and the law are inseparable. They cannot be taken away from each other. And in tonight's passage, we see people who are trying to separate Jesus from the law. Okay, they're, they're not doing it in the same way we try to do this. They're, they're doing it differently. Okay, they're not saying it's a relationship, not a religion. They're saying it's a religion, not a relationship. Okay, but hear me when I say this. Both perspectives are wrong. Okay, the truth, what the entire Bible teaches, what Jesus teaches, is that it's not a relationship or religion, it's a relationship and religion, okay? The truth is that it is a relationship and a religion, and through this passage, we will see Jesus teaching that the will of God is that we would be his children and his followers, okay? That the church, okay, the people of God, that we would be a faith family and people dedicated to following the law. See, we cannot separate Jesus from the law, and we cannot be with Jesus apart from the law, because Jesus and the law are inseparable. And the first thing that we need to know to understand why and how Jesus and the law are inseparable is we need to know what the revealed will of God is. Okay? So this is the first thing. We need to know God's will revealed. Um, and, and to figure out what God's will revealed is, okay, first, we need to know what Scripture means when it refers to the will of God. Okay, so like, what on earth is the will of God? Um, and I'm going to give you guys a super basic definition, okay? 
The will of God is what God wants. Okay, so again, real basic. But, but the will of God is what God wants. And to explain a little bit more, to elaborate on this, the will of God is what God does. Okay, it, it describes what God is like. And importantly to us, it describes what God commands. Okay, so it's what God wants to do. It's, it's what God wants to be like, okay, so his character, and then what he wants us to do. These are all under the umbrella of the will of God, okay? All right, so the will of God, what God wants. And in verse 14 through 18, what we find is that Jesus is in the temple in Jerusalem, and he's teaching, okay? He's teaching something, um, but, but the way that it's described here, Jesus is not just teaching right like he's teaching in a profound way he's teaching powerfully and with incredible authority jesus is teaching in such a way that everyone who hears him is stunned by the things that he is telling them which actually includes the pharisees that are there that were sent there to arrest jesus Okay, there are Pharisees in this crowd who were sent to arrest Jesus for being a blasphemer, for, for claiming to be God. And the men who were sent to arrest Jesus for claiming to be God, the men who hate Jesus, don't touch him because they are so dumbfounded by what he is teaching them. Verse 15 says that they marvel at him. You guys, the teaching of Jesus is so marvelous, and it is so authoritative, and it is so true that the only thing that anyone could think to ask Jesus is, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? Right? They're like, what's going on here? Jesus didn't go to seminary. He, he didn't go to like the rabbinic school of, of, of teaching. Right? He isn't a trained theologian. How can he know so much? They're, they're completely lost and don't understand. And Jesus answers their question in verse 16 and 17 by saying, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. Okay, Jesus' answer here gives us kind of the first clue about what Jesus is teaching about in the temple. Jesus is teaching about the will of God. Okay, and he's saying that this was directly revealed to him by God so that he could reveal it to us. See, Jesus' is teaching here is the revelation of God's will. That's what he's teaching in the temple. He's revealing God's will to them. But, but here's the thing about this, okay? Jesus' teaching here in the temple was not the only place where God's will is revealed. Okay, up into this point, God's will had been revealed already in the Old Testament, primarily through the law. The law teaches us what God wants, okay? And, and you see, what Jesus is saying here is that if anyone's will is to do God's will— he will know whether the teaching, his teaching, is from God or whether, uh, to quote, he's saying, whether I'm speaking on my own authority. See, Jesus is saying that anyone who is in God's revealed will from the Old Testament, right, from the law, will understand that what, teaching, what Jesus is teaching is also the revelation of God's will. Because they will match Okay? What Jesus is teaching here in the temple, it, it's not going against the law. It's not a rejection of the law. It's congruent. Okay? It, it's, it's like a congruent elaboration of the Old Testament law. Jesus is revealing new things about the Old Testament law. Okay? So to show you guys kind of like how this works, I have this diagram in your in your sheets here okay um, and what this is is 
is it's sort of a pyramid of, of God's law, okay? Um, and so you have God's will on the top, okay? And when you break it down, when you filter it down, God's will gets revealed to us through the law, okay? And there's two main categories of the law. Um, there's the moral law, and then there's the ceremonial law. And then if you have a question about the civil law and how that fits into to these two categories, you please ask me after. But there's like 600 of them, and it would make this message really long. Okay, so, so there's the moral law, and then there's the ceremonial law. Okay, and so I'm going to go through uh, the moral law side. So the moral law was written... Uh, and, and it, it has to do with being righteous, okay? So, so being holy. So the moral law is what the perfect person should do or, or would do, okay? So a person who is sinless would do the entire moral law, okay? It would just be a part of who they are. Um, and, and the moral law can get, can get um, right, split up into two categories as well. Okay, Jesus defines the moral law as love God and love people. Okay, so every single moral law fits under one of those two categories. You're either loving God or you're loving people. And then God, in the Mosaic law, gives Moses a, a further breakdown of the moral law. And we call these the Ten Commandments. Okay, so these are, uh, you shall have no other idols. You sh don't take God's name in vain. Don't, don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Don't commit adultery, right? Don't murder. These, those are the Ten Commandments, okay? These all fit within the moral law, okay? And this is what a person would be like if they were perfect, if they were sinless, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, on the other side of the law, we have ceremonial law, okay? Ceremonial law is all about relational redemption, right? We fail to fulfill the moral law. We all sin, okay? And because of sin, God created the ceremonial law. And the goal of the ceremonial law was to bring us back into relationship with God, right? When we sin, because we can't bring sin into God's presence, our relationship with God died. Okay, we it, he had to end it because we can't bring sin to him. We ourselves die. Okay, so so because of that, God created the ceremonial law so that we could be brought back into relationship with God. So it's all about relational redemption, and it breaks down into a, a lot of different practices. Okay, so there's covenant signs. These are things. Uh, like circumcision and baptism and communion. Uh, the rainbow is a covenant sign actually for God, um, not for us. Um, and uh, uh, there's more, but those are the main ones that we think of, right? Circumcision, baptism, communion, the rainbow. Uh, these are covenant signs. Covenant signs have the purpose of reminding us that God makes promises to us, okay? So the covenant signs are... The, for the purpose of reminding us of God's promises. And God's promises within the ceremonial law, we call them covenantal promises, is that he promises to make his people into a great nation. He promises to give his people a great land. Okay, this is the promised land. And he promises to uniquely give his people his presence. Okay, does that make sense? So like Old Testament, think Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was God's unique presence in Israel. Okay, so the covenantal signs are meant to point to these promises, these guarantees that God says he will give to his people. Then you go on to the other side of the ceremonial law. Okay, um, and you get sin cleansing ceremonies. Okay, these are animal sacrifices. Right? So, so God created provisions in the Old Testament um, to point to the fact that in order for our sins to be cleansed, there needed to be a blood sacrifice. Okay? And the way that this worked, it, the, 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 I guess the biggest way that this happened is once a year, there's something called the Day of Atonement. You don't need to remember that. But the priest took a lamb that was without blemish, it was spotless, so in effect, the lamb was perfect, 
the priest would lay hands on the lamb and put the sins of the nation of Israel on this lamb and then kill the lamb. Okay? And that would give Israel forgiveness. It would cleanse them of their sins. That's the ceremony was to point to this idea that in order for our sins to be cleansed, we need a blood sacrifice. We need someone to die in our place. Okay, does that make sense? So I know it's kind of confusing, but if if you're unsure, look at the chart, right? Ceremonial laws to bring us back into relationship with God. Covenant signs point to the promises. And the sin cleansing ceremony points to the need for a blood sacrifice. Okay? Cool. All right. I know it's a lot. <laughs> so if, you're, if you don't get it all, that's okay. okay. This was God's revealed will to us in the Old Testament. Right? This is the law. This is how God revealed his character. See, but when Jesus came, he started teaching. And he started revealing something new about God's will. See, when Jesus teaches, he is revealing that God's will, which is found in the law, is about and fulfilled by Jesus. Okay? So that the entire Old Testament was about and fulfilled by Jesus. That from the beginning... God's will was always for Jesus to come to earth fully man and fully God so that he could follow the moral law perfectly and be the only person who was a perfectly righteous man. And also in order to fulfill the ceremonial law, which cleanses the sins of everyone who believes in Jesus as the fulfillment of the law. You see, God's revealed will is that Jesus would be the spotless, sacrificial lamb that cleanses us of our sin. You see, from the beginning, at the top, God's will was Jesus. Okay, and he revealed it to us through the law. But when Jesus came, he told us, and he revealed something new. That it was, in fact, all about him. Jesus here is teaching that the entire law, which is the revealed will of God, testifies that Jesus himself is the will of God. Okay? This is why it's impossible for us to separate Jesus from the law. Because the entire law is about Jesus. You see, Jesus fulfilled the moral law. Jesus perfectly loved God and loved people, and he didn't fail to meet any of the requirements of the Ten Commandments in action and in his heart. See, Jesus perfectly fulfilled the ceremonial law. It is through his sin-cleansing act of dying on the cross that we are brought back into relational intimacy with God. Okay? It is through Jesus that we became a great nation. It is through Jesus that we are promised a great land. This is heaven. This is the kingdom of God. Okay? It is through Jesus that we have God's unique presence. Jesus is living in us. Okay? Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is the fully revealed will of God. And we are brought into relationship with Jesus by having faith that Jesus perfectly obeyed and fulfilled the law through his life, through his death on the cross, through his resurrection from the grave, and through his ascension to heaven, where he now sits at the right hand of God as king over all of creation. Okay, guys, this... I know I'm talking a lot about the law, but this is actually the relationship part of being a Christian. You see, we are in a relationship with Christ through faith in Jesus' gracious fulfillment of the law on our behalf. We cannot separate Jesus from the law because that's how he saved us. 
by fulfilling it perfectly. Okay, so that is the relationship side. That is God's will revealed. Now, the second thing that we need to know and understand about why we can't separate Jesus from the law is to know how the will of God is applied. Okay? Um, and to explain this, first, I, I kind of need to give you guys some context into this passage. We're jumping into like the middle of a story here that actually started in John chapter 5. Okay, so in John chapter 5, uh, which is at least six months before this passage takes place, Jesus was also in Jerusalem. Okay, Jesus was in Jerusalem, and uh, he was teaching there, and he comes across a man who's an invalid. Okay, so he comes across a man who can't move. Um, and he goes up to this man, and he asks this man if he wants to be healed. And he's like, yeah, of course I want to be healed. And so Jesus tells him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Okay, and he does. Okay, so, so this man was miraculously healed by Jesus. And he goes, and he picks up his mat, and he starts walking. Uh, but something that's important to note about uh, when this happened, Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath. Okay, this is the day of rest when, when uh, it was ruled that you were not supposed to do any work. And so the Pharisees saw this man walking, carrying a mat, and they're like, whoa, 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 hey, you can't carry that mat because you can't work on the Sabbath. Right? And this guy's response is, well, the guy that healed me told me to, so you're going to have to take it up with that guy. And they're like, well, who is this guy? And he's like, I have no idea. And so then, you know, he leaves. And the Pharisees are like in this tizzy um, because they also don't think that anyone should be healing on the Sabbath. Um, because apparently that also breaks, apparently that's, that's work. And so that breaks the Sabbath as well. Um, and so the Pharisees are looking for this person. Uh, and then they find out that it's Jesus, actually, because the paralytic tells him uh, that it's Jesus. So they find Jesus and they confront him. And they say, what are you doing healing on the Sabbath? What are you doing working on the Sabbath? And Jesus responds by saying, well, my father is working on the Sabbath, so I'm going to do it too. And then they're like, hold on. Did you just say that you're equal with God? And Jesus responds by saying, yep, because I'm God. And they freak out, okay? They're really mad at Jesus. They want to arrest Jesus and kill him because they are calling him a lawbreaker for working on the Sabbath, and they think he is a blasphemer because he is calling himself God. Because this takes place in chapter 5. Um, but before they can arrest Jesus, he leaves. Okay? He leaves, and he goes to Galilee, and he feeds 5,000 people, and he walks on water, and he says that he's the bread of life. He does all this cool stuff. Which then takes us to, to chapter 7. He comes back to Jerusalem. And he starts teaching in the temple. But the Pharisees did not forget what Jesus told them. And so they again are seeking to arrest and kill Jesus. Okay, so this is the context that we are in. This is the context uh, that we find uh, in this passage when Jesus is teaching. When Jesus explains to the people, and specifically to the Pharisees who were there to kill him, that they are wanting to kill Jesus for breaking the law because they are incorrectly applying the law. Okay? Jesus is telling them that he's not actually breaking the Sabbath by healing people on the Sabbath. And he explains this to them by using the example of circumcision. You see, guys, the law says that every Jewish male that is born must get circumcised after they are eight days old. Okay, But if that day happens to fall on the Sabbath, right, the Pharisees, uh, actually rightly, decided that the circumcision still needed to be done. Okay, and, and so they were said that because the circumcision needed to be done, because they didn't want to break the law of circumcision, uh, that circumcising on the Sabbath doesn't count as work. Okay, again, they were right. Okay, and so they were saying that they were not breaking the Sabbath 
if they have to circumcise on the Sabbath. But Jesus takes this example and is practically screaming at them. He's like, you circumcise on the Sabbath, and you're angry with me because on the Sabbath I made an entire person better. Right? He's, he's like, what is wrong with you? How can you be so hypocritical? Jesus is telling them that he healed this man in accordance to the law. Okay, that by healing this man, Jesus was applying the will of God. Okay, what specific part of the law was Jesus applying? Love people. Jesus was applying the law by healing this man because he was loving this man. See, Jesus is so angry at them because they are trying to use the law as a weapon to condemn and kill him as a lawbreaker. And this is so maddening because as Jesus says in verse 19, no one keeps the law, right? They are all lawbreakers, and yet they are wanting to kill Jesus as a lawbreaker, even though he's the only one who isn't breaking the law. He's the only one who has never broken the law. See, the Pharisees are completely misunderstanding how to apply the will of God. The Pharisees are applying the will of God, they're applying the law of God as a hammer to destroy sinners. But Jesus is trying to explain to them that we were given the law for the purpose of saving sinners. Okay, just, just compare how the Pharisees apply the law and how Jesus applies the law. You see, the Pharisees think that they see Jesus break the law, and they want to kill him according to the law. So that's example one. See a lawbreaker? Kill him. That's what the Pharisees do. But then you have Jesus. Jesus comes across an invalid who is a lawbreaker, and Jesus heals him according to the law. You see... The correct application of the law, the religion of the Christian, if you will, is to always apply God's will for the purpose of healing, not condemning. You guys remember, the moral law says love God and love people. And the ceremonial law is for the purpose of healing our relationship with God. The, the will of God applied is for the restoration of everything that sin has destroyed. The, the law of God applied is for the restoration of creation. And this is accomplished through Jesus. You see, it is impossible to separate Jesus from the law because Jesus is the law applied. See, it is through Jesus' love of God, it is through Jesus' love of us that we have been saved. And so again, the Christian religion is to apply the love of Christ for the restoration of all things. Okay, but but uh, how does that work, right? Like, what does that look like? Okay, and to give you guys an example of what this can look like. Um, so when I was a camp counselor, I had this camper uh, who was maybe like the angriest person I've ever met, right? And he is like eight and just so angry. He, he hated people, he hated authority, he was just unbelievably angry. Um, and I had the very difficult privilege of uh, spending eight hours a day, five days a week with him for a total of six months, okay? Um, and somehow he became my guy, right? So, so um, uh, and this was over the course of two summers. So, so five days a week, eight hours a day, over six months, okay? Um, I spent a lot of time with him, and I love that dude, but... Man, it was hard. 
right? It was one of the hardest relationships that I have ever had because I was constantly like, I was like having to take things from him and, and having to discipline him and having to like correct him because he was just always breaking all of our rules and, and like hurting people. Okay, and, and so I, I was I was like like always trying to teach him how, how to like control himself when he's angry, uh, uh, how, how to how to let things go, okay, how how to forgive people, how to love other people well, and you know how to follow the rules, right? Because most of the rules of this camp were for his safety. If he breaks them, he could hurt himself, right? So so I'm trying to teach him all these things constantly, and I'm constantly having to like punish him for not doing what I'm teaching him. And uh, I remember that there's there's this one time uh, when we were both pretty frustrated with each other. So he was mad at me, and I was mad at him, and, and, and he, he just, he just in his frustration, he just yells at me. He's like, if I'm so terrible, why won't you just leave me alone? And so, so then I you know, yell back at him. I was like, I can't! I will never leave you alone! Okay? And then he yells back, why not? And then I responded a little calmer. I like, just controlled myself a little bit. And I told him, I was like, I will never leave you alone. Because Jesus loves you. And so I love you. You see, this, this camper of mine was a horrible sinner. But Jesus, who lives in me, loves him. Okay, and so Jesus, who lives in me, compelled me to love him. He compelled me to love him according to the law so that Jesus might heal him. That is the Christian religion. You guys, how in, are you and I supposed to apply the law of God? We apply the law of God by applying the love of Christ to everything that sin has broken. Okay, so let me give you some examples, right? So we go to church. According to the law, we go to church. And the reason why we do this is because we are broken. We've been broken by sin. And at church, the love of Christ is applied to us, and we apply it to those who are with us. And we do this by serving, we do this by fellowshipping with each other, by being in relationship with each other, by praising God together, by weeping together, and by studying God's word together. Okay, uh, Another thing that we do according to the law is we confess our sins to each other. Okay? We are commanded to confess our sins to each other, and we do this so that the person we are confessing to can apply the love of Christ to us by reminding us that sin is destructive and so that they can help us turn away from it. Okay? When we see someone who is making destructive choices in their own life, according to the law, you apply the love of Christ by confronting them, by telling them that it is wrong, and by steering them away from their destructive choices. You see, guys, we read and memorize the Bible so that the Word of God can heal us, and so that we can use it to heal others. We feed the homeless, and we care for the sick, because the love of Christ applies to the whole person, body and soul. You guys, we share the gospel because it is only through faith in Christ that we can be eternally healed. We follow the law. We follow the law because we follow Jesus, who is the will of God applied. You guys, it is impossible for us to separate Jesus from the law because the law which is the will of God is fully revealed and applied by Jesus Jesus is the embodiment of God's will you see it's not a relationship or a religion it's a relationship and a religion church, a 
according to the will of God is a faith family of Christ followers. Okay, we are a faith family of Christ followers. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, um, we thank you for the law. We thank you that you have revealed your will to us, that you have showed us what you are like, that you have shown us what you have done for us, uh, and that you have uh, very explicitly told us how you want us to be, how you want us to act, how you want us to love people. Lord, I pray that everyone here uh, doesn't have a low view of the law, God, that we can see the law and that we can see littered through it is the love of Christ. Because that, that is your will, that, that Christ would love us according to the law. Uh, we thank you and we love you, God. We pray this all in your name. Amen.